So moving along in Steiner then, we're uh, a little over the halfway mark on Outline of Esoteric Science here, and now we're going to talk about Atlantis, his version of the Atlantis myth. Um, this does raise an interesting issue with regard to Steiner's objectivity. How true are the things that Steiner is saying he sees on the supersensible realm? How, how true are they really? Do they really correspond to something objective, something ontologically true? And I think that um, probably not always. Um, I think there's a lot of myth-making going on here. But to use Plato's phrase, which, which I like very much, the, he, where he covers his tracks, every time he's about to recite a myth in place of a factual truth, he substitutes a myth for it. And he says, either this or something like it happened. <laughs> I love how he, he covers his tracks that way. It was either this or something something similar to it. So I do think there is truth in Steiner's model. Um, there definitely is a super sensible world. There definitely is an astral body and an etheric body. Uh, we definitely do reincarnate. Karma is real. Uh, there are angelic hierarchies. Uh, there are spirit guides that help us. All, all these things are true ontologically and objectively, I think. But the extent to which Steiner's model is a product of its time, and we have to realize that this book was published in 1910, and he was probably working on it in 1908, 1909, 10, while delivering uh, lectures. <laughs> Uh, he had written an earlier version of it uh, in 1904, around the age of 40. Uh, this was written as he was approaching 50. It's his summa, the, the, the whole summa of his uh, worldview. Um, and the Atlantis myth, of course, was very common currency in those days, in the early decades of the 20th century. Uh, Jocelyn Godwin has an excellent book on it called Arctos, where he talks about the popularity of the Atlantis myth during this time, how the Nazis picked it up, and they liked it, too, even though they hated Steiner. And uh, there is some evidence that they may have burned down Steiner's first Gertanum. Um, so they, they, they picked up the Atlantis myth. Tolkien picks it up uh, as late as the 1950s. He's reworking it in the Silmarillion. I distinctly remember uh, the fate of a little island. I think it was a star-shaped island that was destroyed by a flood. Um, H.P. Lovecraft also, at about the same time in the 1930s, had picked up elements of the Atlantis myth. Um, so it was in the air at the time as something that, if you were interested in esoteric studies, you pro chances are you probably believed in it in one way or another. Um, is it true? Probably not, actually. We don't know where Atlantis would have been. There's no evidence for it in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the commentator uh, of the... Uh, of the uh, the line-by-line -line, uh, excursus here says he thinks it might be off the coast of the Netherlands, the, the so-called Dogger Bank, whatever that is. Um, I think all of that's just misplaced concreteness. The point of the myth is that there was a time when human beings were living in connection, in easy connection with the spiritual world, and there was a flow, like a flow of good superconductive electric current, let's say, where all the resistance has been removed so that the electrons can line up in pairs and conduct perfectly. Normally, we conduct electricity. Uh, the electricity goes through uh, whatever we're conducting it through, and it gets a lot of resistance. The electrons go through in a, in a disorganized, bouncy way, so we lose a lot. Uh, with superconductivity, that doesn't happen. You use a special type of uh, supercooled substance that conducts the electrons in, in a perfect flow. of Two by two, they line up. And I think that something similar happened during this period of Atlantis, uh, and the myth is the idea that we've lost this this easy contact with the super sensible world, with the realm of higher beings, um, and conceptual thinking has come in, and materialism has come in over the, the centuries, the millennia, and, and taken the place of these abilities. I, I think that much of it is true. Um, so trying to nail down where Atlantis was um, uh, is, is totally missing the point. I think, though, I do want to do a shout-out for Mary Setagast, whose book, Plato Prehistorian, um, is a wonderful book that goes through and looks at the possibility of an epipaleolithic uh, war that took place uh, in and around the western Mediterranean, around the Straits of Gibraltar in North Africa. And she looks at rock art from that period and the sudden appearance of, of uh, arrowheads. Um, and it does look like some sort of war took place, so the way she arranges the evidence anyway. And she thinks Atlantis may date back to 10,000 B.C. and may actually refer to this conflict. It may not be a real, actual, physical place. 
Um, so I highly recommend her book. I wouldn't mind doing a chapter by chapter of it uh, on, on here as well. Um, so we have had the Lemurian catastrophe, and it's in this section that he does mention Lemuria for the first time in the preceding section as having been Lemurian. This is in paragraph 89, and it's on page uh, 240 where he mentions the Hyperborean and the, the Lemurian, but not the Polarian, which he mentions in uh, Cosmic Memory. So the Polarian would be uh, the first stage of Earth, the fire stage, which as we have seen, it begins as this fireball. And then once it densifies into air, then we have the Hyperborean stage, I think. It, each one of these corresponds to one of the densifications of the elements. And then the Lemurian stage that we have just passed through is the densification to water, uh, and then the densification into solids, uh, the, and the, followed by the extrusion of the moon, uh, and the densification into solids and dealing with reincarnating back in physical bodies that are becoming harder and harder to work with. Then we have this Atlantean phase uh, that we're going to talk about here. So that's uh, five phases, and then we've had a post-Atlantean. So we're right now we're in uh, the fifth of these epochs, which is the post-Atlantean, um, uh, there'll be two more after this. Everything has to come out to seven in Steiner, which is another one of his stencils that brings into question a, a certain amount of subjectivity, but that's okay. You have to organize the information somehow. Um, so two epochs after this, uh, two more cosmic epochs the, after this, the, the Jupiter and Vulcan uh, epochs, and then um, the post-Atlantean period that we're in also can be subdivided into seven phases, and we're on the fifth of those. As we'll see after the Atlantean, the post-Atlantean consists of the ancient Indian Hindu civilization, the Persian civilization, the Egypto-Chaldean civilization, and then the Greco-Latin civilization, and then our Western civilization, uh, which he sees beginning around uh, in the 15th uh, century, right around the year 1500, for the consciousness soul to come in and this civilization to work it out, which will be then followed by a sixth or Russian cycle, and a seventh or American cycle, whatever distant future uh, comes out of the American uh, continent. Um, it's curious to me also that there's no reference to China or Chinese civilization or Mesoamerican civilization. Um, Chinese civilization was there, was fully known about. Not sure why Steiner pass, quietly passes over it. Mesoamerican civilization he can get a pass on because the archaeology was not very well known in 1909. Uh, so he gets a pass on skipping over Mesoamerica, but not China. One does wonder about uh, why he skips over China. Why, why isn't that on here as one of these uh, great post-Atlantean epochs? So what happens then is that um, um, there's a certain group of... So we get the Lemurian catastrophe, and then those individuals, those humans who are still the most untouched by error, then migrate west to uh, a place, Steiner doesn't say whether it's an island or a continent or whatever it is, but they migrate west to a place called Atlantis. And there what they do is they set up these oracles. And the oracles are these places where you go to commune with the planetary divinities. And the initiates are these individuals who have managed to, um, what Steiner says is to have... Uh, sort of remove themselves as much as possible from the passions and desires of the astral body, um, which I take it to mean carnality and sex. Um, I take it that's what he means. These individuals were more inclined to purely supersensible and spiritual realms. And, these and eventually these will become races. The human beings who stayed on the planet through the whole cycle with the extrusion of the the sun and the other planets and the extrusion of the moon, and they went through it, uh, are individuals in whom the Christ impulse is very strong because Christ was one of the beings on the sun who led the extrusion of the sun from the earth. And um, the, the human etheric bodies uh, have a very strong influence from that Christ being. And so the Christ uh, initiate, the master initiate of the mysteries of, of, of the sun, um, already knew about Christ and already had these other initiates. And each of the planets, especially at first the outer planets, had their own oracle. So there was an oracle for Saturn, an oracle for Jupiter, and an oracle for Mars. 
And these oracles were places that you would go to in Atlantis to confer with these wise ones, these elders. Uh, but recall, too, also that when the sun split from the Earth, um, Venus and Mercury uh, ex were extruded from the sun uh, to become planets. And a being named Vulcan also, uh, Steiner says here in this passage, he was the first actually to be expelled from the sun once the sun pulled out, uh, away from the Earth. Uh, but it's interesting that Vulcan doesn't have a planet, although in esoteric traditions, apparently it was thought that there was a, a planet named Vulcan in between Mercury and the Sun. Either way, he says Vulcan, uh, Vulcan is the, the great blacksmith in Greek uh, mythology, Hephaestus in Greek mythology, Vulcan in Roman, but he's the blacksmith. So his followers and his initiates that form a cult around him begin to lay the basis for the arts and sciences because of their immersion in matter and the entanglement, they have a much stronger entanglement of their senses with the physical world. And so eventually this will lead to uh, manipulating matter and the arts and the sciences will come out of that. As opposed to the oracles of Venus and Mercury, especially Mercury, which are there for development of the knowledge of the supersensible realms. Um, those are the inner planets and the outer planets, Saturn, Mars and Jupiter, have a different valency. They tend to attract uh, lower humans um, humans who are vibrating at a different frequency, um, and they receive their knowledge uh, from these planetary divinities, Steiner doesn't say who they are, uh, in the form of revelations, uh, where they just get these revelations that are much more like uh, pictorial dreaming consciousness revelations, whereas the inner planets eventually lead uh, Venus and Mercury and Vulcan to, to conceptual thinking. Um, the, those oracles get their thoughts from concepts rather than revelations. So there's a difference between the kinds of initiations that the inner planets give, which are conceptual and lay the basis for the future, and the outer planets, which are still uh, revelatory and still based on sort of uh, religious uh, types of revelations and symbolic thinking, Steiner says. Um, so we have these initiates preserving the ancient mysteries in these cults. Um, and um, the, human, the human form was different, uh, Steiner says. Y even in the Atlantean period, he doesn't give a date for this, but he just says that in the Atlantean period, the, the human body was actually still soft and much more malleable than ours is today. Uh, it wasn't solid the way ours is, um, but it became so over time, um, over the course of the Atlantean epoch, as they lost contact. Uh, with the super sensible world, the physical body got harder, firmer, and more dense. And eventually, with the end of the Atlantean period, took on the form that it has now, that we've inherited ever since, where the etheric body has become almost identical with the physical body to such an extent that the etheric body transformed the brain into the instrument of cognition. Whereas when these initiates were able to separate the ether body from the physical body, they were able to use the ether body as a sort of device, let's say, for communicating with the spiritual realm, with the higher beings. Um, so you still have to have a certain amount of the ether body available for usage in order to communicate with the higher realms. Um, that's just how it's done. So human forms were, were quite a bit different. Steiner says that the, uh, the more sensual of these humans had larger physiques and the more spiritual of these humans were smaller in size. I don't know what leads him to say that, but he does. Um, so we have the densification of, of human form and then the catastrophe that eventually destroyed Atlantis slowly starts to set in and Steiner's extremely vague about uh, his account here. He says that there were these humans uh, in Atlantis who began to use uh, super sensible knowledge in an evil way, in a depraved way, especially knowledge concerning what he calls the natural forces of growth and reproduction uh, by means of which I, I suppose he means sexuality, uh, reproduction. Uh, se sexual reproduction has already long since been invented here. Um, so somehow they're misusing it. Maybe they're having orgies. I don't, I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Whatever they're doing, they're misusing uh, the forces of growth and reproduction, and it's depraving uh, a, a certain, certain groups within the Atlanteans. And Steiner says there's a connection between the forces of growth and reproduction, and specifically air and water. He says it's a mysterious connection. He doesn't go into it. But it caused disturbances in their weather. 
and in water, which led to a series of catastrophes, constant uh, planetary storms that were huge, that forced these individuals to migrate east. Um, and so they migrated to Europe, Asia, and Africa, and their descendants then populated uh, these three continents. These are the three from the ancient TNO maps, where you'd make a map in the shape of a T that would have the three different continents divided by uh, the Nile River, and then uh, uh, all three of the continents would be there. The discovery of America, of, co of course, destroyed those TNO maps, and they had to be recreated then as globes. Um, so that the circles and the TNO maps are replaced by globes with the discovery of the missing fourth. Just like in Young's theory, there's always, in any th threesome, there's always a missing fourth. There's a mysterious fourth that's not accounted for. Um, uh, but the initiates, though, uh, as it, Atlantis is disintegrating and they're migrating, there are certain initiates in these cult mysteries, these oracles, who keep the knowledge. Um, and there's one individual in particular who was a master of the Christ uh, initiations, uh, the Sun initiations, who not only kept knowledge of the Christ cult, but knowledge of the other planetary oracles as well, which he could rebuild with ease. So he took knowledge of them with him. Uh, on these migrations in order to teach disciples about what the initial mysteries were for accessing the gods, basically, the, the, the super sensible world. And this individual also, uh, Steiner elsewhere calls this the principle of spiritual economy. He has a lecture cycle, which I highly recommend. It was one of the first books that I read by Steiner, uh, which clicked, which I just started reading and I couldn't stop. And for the first time, uh, reading that book, Steiner was no longer a struggle. And from that point on, I just figured him out. It was a lecture cycle that he did in 1909, about the same time uh, that he was working on this book. We're talking about this principle of spiritual economy in which not only does is it the case that the I, the soul, transmigrates from lifetime to lifetime, but there is a principle of spiritual economy whereby the best etheric bodies and the best astral bodies created by these individuals are preserved and can be copied. Not only can they be copied, I have no idea how, uh, but they're copied by these initiates and they can be transplanted into un other in individuals. So it's a weird sort of different form of reincarnation. I remember him saying in that book, it's been forever since I've read it, something about uh, Galileo maybe inheriting the etheric body of, I don't know, Nicholas of Cusa or somebody. Uh, I forget what the concrete examples are, but because it's been so long. But that principle of copying ether bodies and astral bodies and transplanting them into other individuals, which spiritually accelerates them. I guess today we would just say, uh, well, the guy has a talent for it. Uh, Mozart uh, came in with a talent for music. Uh, we don't know what his past lives were, though, that, that built him up uh, to that event, the Mozart event, where he could be born with those abilities. Um, so then the betrayal, he says, of the Vulcan mysteries, though, that various of these mysteries are then scattered and dispersed across the globe, uh, and they're used for good and bad purposes. They're understood or misunderstood. But he says the betrayal of the Vulcan mysteries had a deleterious effect, uh, um, particularly because the Vulcan mysteries are tied to the physical plane, and they have to do with uh, the arts and sciences and manipulating matter, and that eventually will lead, of course, to materialism, especially when some of these groups of individuals now come under the influence of a, of a being called Ahriman, who's the Persian name in Zoroastrianism that Zarathustra gives to the god of matter, the evil being there, who becomes the prototype, of course, for Satan when the Jews are taken into captivity um, and restored by Cyrus. Um, they come into the influence of Persian mythology and they pick up Ahriman and translate him into Satan. Um, so Ahriman becomes the god who is associated with matter. And with drawing a veil down over the super sensible world and tricking human beings into believing that matter is the only thing that matters, that machines are all that matter, and this sets the West on a certain course. He says uh, Mephistopheles and Faust is the same being. Mephistopheles is the god of the machine. He's always there to provide you with whatever experience you want. But what you get from the experience, uh, whether it's you know having sex with a woman, uh, whether it's learning alchemy uh, or astrology, whether it's having this experience or that experience, um, doesn't matter what the experience is. Mephistopheles can provide it for you. 
but it's up to you to extract the human lesson out of the experience, which is a sort of, you know, kind of a miniature version of what, of what we're doing on the global scale here with all these incarnations. We learn different things from each one of them um, that we take with us. And so he says that um, the betrayal of the mysteries now um, caused, during the Atlantean period, but not after it, during the Atlantean period it caused grotesque human forms to appear. Because uh, for Steiner, this is the old idea of physiognomy, where the outer physical is a reflection of the inner spiritual, which is actually true to, to an extent. Um, it's just not a, a reliable science. Uh, it's not 100% reliable. Like I remember Schopenhauer critiquing it, saying, yeah, it does tend to be the case that people with high intellects do tend to have higher foreheads, but it's also the case that people with higher foreheads might not have great intellects. So the, you can always furnish contrary examples to what might be a norm for physiognomies, but there's enough going against it to, to, for us to toss it out. But nonetheless, Steiner here is saying that these weird, amorphous-looking monsters, and maybe he's referring here to the myth of Genesis 6 and the Nephilim, uh, where the angels uh, interbreed with human females to produce these grotesque giants that introduce sodomy, homosexuality, all, all these kinds of depravities. And that may be what Steiner is referring here uh, by those Atlantean individuals who misuse the forces of growth and reproduction. He may indeed be referring to homosexuality here, now that I, now that I think about it, uh, because that's what the Jewish myth of the Nephilim uh, says, brought about the flood. Uh, the flood. And Steiner doesn't say Atlantis was destroyed by a flood. That's the standard version of the myth as we all understand it. Uh, he doesn't say that, though. He's, he says there were disturbed weather patterns. He doesn't even say that it, that it was a continent that sank or an island that sank. He just says people migrated, Atlantis became unusable. Uh, the, the etheric body, the physical body was densifying, finally taking its final form, and the etheric body was becoming more and more identical with it and more and more difficult to free up for usage or communicating with spiritual beings. And so as a result, um, you slowly get the identity of the etheric body with the physical body, and it shapes the brain into the primary transmitter of intellect. No longer uh, knowledge of the supersensible worlds, which we've lost, which is Steiner's whole point. It's also Gene Gebser's whole point in the ever-present origin, that we've gradually lost touch with these abilities. Um, so that's pretty much the Atlantis myth as he gives it uh, let's see if there's anything I've missed here. Uh, and, he, and he says, only after this then <clears throat> is all over do, do humans then physically experience the principle of I, the capital letter I, uh, as identical with the physical body, with the first time once the etheric body has become uh, pretty much identified with the physical body. And uh, I remember him saying elsewhere that some of these Atlanteans had halos. Uh, that was their etheric body <clears throat> sticking up out over the head still and is the origin for uh, where we get the idea in art of the halo. Uh, maybe um, the halo doesn't actually appear until the Hellenistic period. It's, it's a very late invention in classical art um, that may actually have come from the West and migrated to the East um, into Buddhism, not the other way around. Uh, so... The ether body has withdrawn into the physical body as the human form has densified, contracted, and solidified over time. So the next, um, what we'll do is look at the post-Atlantean epochs. There are uh, four of those ahead of ours, the Indian. Um, and he pushes the dates for these absurdly far back. I think the Indian epoch he pushes back into something like 8,000 BC maybe, or just a way farther back than you can push them. The, the dates just don't line up. Um, India and then Persia, and definitely not for Persia. I don't know why he puts Persia as the second oldest of these civilizations. It absolutely is not. It's an Indo-Aryan civilization, uh, which makes it, and so is the Hindu civilization also. These are Indo-Aryan civilizations which come in during the second generation of civilization, according to Toynbee, not the first, which is the Egyptian and Sumero-Babylonian civilizations, which, however, Steiner calls the, the Egypto-Chaldean civilization, and he puts that third, and then puts uh, the Greco-Latin civilization. I'm sure if you imagine the shape of a V, uh, I think there's a diagram of this in the essential Steiner, 
uh, where at the, the apex of the V uh, occurs during this Greco-Latin civilization where the Christ incarnation occurs and it becomes uh, the axis, what Hegel called the, uh, the axial event, the incarnation of Christ as the axial event, the hinge on which everything else turns. And our civilization that begins around the year 1500 AD is uh, the, the Western civilization that begins is the first civilization on up, uh, moving up the slots, and then there'll be a, a sixth and a seventh, a Russian and, a, and an American. And so that puts our civilization in resonance in a certain way with the Egyptian civilization on that V-shape. Um, and the Egyptian sense of mastery over the physical plane is in resonance with our mastery over the physical plane, except in their case it was the mastery over uh, funerary services of the physical plane, in order to preserve the, the mummy. And then so he'll say that each of these civilizations are in resonance with each other, that um, the next civilization after ours, the sixth, will be in resonance then with the, um, not the Egyptian, but ours is in resonance with the Egyptian, but with the Persian, and then the last of those civilizations with the, the, Hindu, with the Indian civilization. So there'll be certain recapitulations, um, but the incarnation of Christ uh, is an axial event because it actually transforms the vibratory structure of the earth. Uh, the blood of Christ, when it leaks onto the ground, actually introduces a spiritual element from outside that has come from the sun that was not there before and changes the vibratory structure of the earth. So it's, a, it's truly an axial event. So we'll look at the post-Atlantean epochs next.